Good afternoon. So as uh, stated, my name is Emilio Cruz. I'm with the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission, not to be confused with the California Public Utilities Commission. Our role and responsibility is primarily is in San Francisco and relates to water, wastewater, and power, electric power. Uh, before I go into those details, I was asked to talk a little bit about my background. How many of you are here are born and raised in the Bay Area? Good population. So I, I'm a transplant. Uh, I was born and raised in South Chicago. Uh, I grew up uh, to an immigrant family. My father came to the United States from Mexico. Uh, my parents had an eighth grade education and a high school education. But the one thing they were uh, com completely committed to was the fact that my sister and I would go to college. And so unlike programs like this growing up, I didn't have that uh, exposure or that uh, push to move on into the technical arena. But I had my parents, which is, I was very, very fortunate to have my parents. And so as I was growing up, it was never a question of whether or not I would go to college and just somehow they brainwashed us very early on and it was going to be high school, high school, college, and then work. So, um, having grown up in South Chicago, I went to parochial school, uh, growing up Mexican and Catholic. Uh, they wanted me to go to a Catholic uh, grammar school, Catholic high school. And, and even though the, the, the parochial schools were better than the public schools in South Chicago, there still was a pretty big gap between the college readiness, at least the national college readiness of the school that I went to, uh, versus uh, a lot of the schools, uh, especially here in the Bay Area. So. For me, I, I, I never knew where I wanted to go. I didn't know anything about college. As I said, my parents never went to college. Uh, but I knew I wanted to be an engineer or an architect. I knew I wanted to be in this technical arena. I knew I wanted to be involved in building things. And I uh, went to school, worked hard, got good grades, you know, did the well-rounded student varsity football, student government, things like that. And then when it time, came time for me to go to college, I went to my high school counselor and I said, you know, I want to go, I want to, go to college, I want to be an engineer, and I want to know what the best engineering schools in the country are. So my counselor told me, well, you know, the University of Illinois has a downtown campus, um, and they have a very good program, and if you get in there, that'd be great, but if you can't, there's a nice small Benedictine college in Southern Illinois that you can get into. And I asked the counselor, are those the best engineering schools in the country? And my counselor told me, yes, those are the best engineering schools for you. And not knowing any better, I took that to heart. Uh, I had a conversation with uh, some friends. And they were like, no, no way. you got to at least open up. you got to look at all opportunities. So I started doing my own research, doing my own homework, looking at all the schools in the country, uh, back then, we didn't have the benefit of uh, the internet. I'm old enough that I can say that. Um, and, and I just started reaching out to schools. Uh, at the end of the day, I was accepted to Stanford University, University of Chicago, Northwestern University, and MIT. And so clearly, there was a gap between where my high school teacher thought I should be and where the rest of the world thought that I should be. And so the one thing I always tell students is don't limit yourself by anyone's opinion other than your own. And make sure your own opinion is a valid one. Because we often limit ourselves based on what we think other people think of us. So, so really take every opportunity, take opportunity of programs like this. Think about what you want to do, where you want to be, and shoot for it. You know, the journey itself will be an education. For me, uh, the journey was a challenge. I, I got to Stanford, I enrolled in the engineering program, and there was a pretty good chasm between where my high school left off and where Stanford freshman year began. And I struggled. I struggled mightily through my first two years, calculus and physics in particular, uh, because I just did not have a bridge that, that got me where I needed to be. Um, so I, I was not your standard four-year student. Uh, I was playing a lot of catch-up, uh, but I did not give up. I worked through it. Uh, I eventually graduated, got my uh, civil engineering degree from Stanford University, and then moved out into the workforce. I started working for the city because at the time that I got out, uh, we were in the middle of a recession. 
not unlike the one we just are coming out of. And the private sector did not have a lot of interesting projects going on, whereas the public sector still did. The public sector tends to lag behind the private sector because it takes a while to get funding in place, especially on these mega projects. And uh, so I moved in, I moved to the city and county of San Francisco, or went to go work for the city and county of San Francisco. Had a great experience there, started out as a junior civil engineer. And, and the thing I'll say is, I, I used to think that being a lawyer was a great thing because really you could go into law, but you can use that parlay into a lot of other arenas. You don't have to practice law for the rest of your life. I think today that is equally true for engineering. You can get an engineering degree or a science degree, move into a workplace, get experience, and if you love it, stay. But if something else is of interest, you can parlay that into other things. Myself, I spent my early years as an engineer, somehow got more involved in administration and policy, uh, actually served as uh, chief of staff to Mayor Willie Brown, uh, served as the director for uh, San Francisco Public Transportation System, Muni, uh, and then wound up going into the private sector, back into the engineering arena, but spending a lot more of my focus on operations and business development. Uh, but always I kept an interest in capital projects. That was kind of my love. And, and so I've had a great career because I've been able to stay in and out of the technical world for all my career. And I, I say that I've also been uh, in the right place. I've been lucky that when there's been times of opportunity and transition, I've been there, I've been ready for them, I've been willing to take them. And my last transition was actually back into the private public sector after 12 years in the private sector in my new role as Assistant General Manager for the Public Utilities Commission. I want to let you know a little bit about what I'm doing today um, and the fact that there are plenty of opportunities here in the Bay Area in the technical arena really for the next decade, if not more. So as I was saying before, the uh, PUC is about water, power, and wastewater, or as most of you refer, sewer. Uh, we have an amazing system in San Francisco. Uh, decades ago, there was a visionary by the name of O'Shaughnessy, who was a city engineer, and he figured out that in order to deal with the Bay Area water supply, given what the projected growth was, that we had to find a good, affordable source of water. And it turns out that was all the way up in Yosemite. So they, under his leadership, the city took on the effort, they built O'Shaughnessy Dam and created Hetch Hetchy Reservoir. That reservoir provides most of the drinking water, not only for San Francisco, but for 23 cities in the Bay Area that we sell water to because they don't have their own independent water source. We are able to move that water 167 miles from Yosemite all the way into San Francisco using purely gravity. So there's no energy spent moving that water. More importantly, we've also built hydroelectric plants, which are shown here. There's the Moccasin Power Plant, Kirkwood, and Home Power Plants. And as that water transmits down using pure uh, gravity, we are able to generate hydroelectric power. We generate over 1.6 terawatt hours of hydroelectric power on an annual basis, which we then turn around to power all city functions, the, um, our own buildings, our own operations, city hall, hall of justice, the courthouses, uh, all the muni electric buses, all powered by Hetch Hetchy uh, hydroelectric power. We bring the water down to the Bay Area, where then we have local storage at Calaveras Reservoir, at San Antonio Reservoir, and on this side of the peninsula, a little bit from here, uh, Crystal Springs Reservoir in San Andreas. We embarked on a major capital program about nine years ago, which we, dis we determined that our own system had been neglected basically since it was originally built uh, under O'Shaughnessy's watch, and that we really needed to make some improvements, primarily to deal with redundancy and resiliency and the fact that we were in a high seismic area. So the PUC embarked on a $4.6 billion capital program to basically create redundancy along the uh, water transmission line full 167 miles. It involved 82 separate projects going through seven counties, 
good news is that uh, they also had the vision to buy all the land we needed back in the day, so at least we were staying within our own right of way, even though we were going through multiple country, uh, counties. This here is a, a sample of the Crystal Springs Bypass Tunnel. It was a, a considerable amount of tunneling done as part of this project. I talked about Hetch Hetchy. This is the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir. This is owned and operated by the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission up in Yosemite, and it provides at full capacity 1.3 billion gallons of water for the Bay Area. And, and it is such a pristine environment, as you can see by this picture, that the water is so pure that basically when we take it and start running it through our hydro plants, we basically do an ultraviolet purification there. Once it gets into the tunnels, it's staying in the tunnels, and it's not exposed to anything, and basically runs from here straight to your tap, if you're one of the cities that we're, we're selling water to. If we wind up having to pull it out, put it into one of our local reservoirs, then we do treat it at one of our local plants because now we've exposed it to the atmosphere and perhaps uh, uh, contaminants in the air. The overall water system improvement program is currently 76% complete. 62 of the 82 projects in that program are done. Uh, we are past our peak of construction, but we still have approximately $1.5 billion worth of work to do on the water program over the next two to three years. This is one of the more interesting projects and the one that will be the, uh, almost the last one finished. Calaveras Dam, which is also right here on the peninsula, uh, it was an earthen dam and uh, it was determined to be vulnerable in a seismic activity and so we decided we needed to, needed to build a new dam. So we're building a new earth dam downstream from the old dam. This equipment, you know, just to give you perspective, this tiger here is about seven and a half feet tall. And when this puppy gets a flat tire, it costs over $7,000 to change that tire. So, so that's the size and scale we're dealing with here. We had to move a lot of earth. That wall back there, it's shiny because it's tarped, because there's natural asbestos. Uh, serpentine rock is a natural rock in California, which contains asbestos naturally. So we had to deal with this as a hazardous waste site and, and protect uh, the asbestos from becoming friable. But we're, we're working in this environment, and even though we did over 11,000 feet of borings and spent $4 million testing the soil, when you start moving this much earth, you don't know what you're going to find. On this project, we found historic underground landslides that actually created unsafe environments for the excavation that we were uh, uh, planning here. We ultimately had to redesign the project, slope the excavation more, and, and if you can wrap your head around these numbers, as a result, we're going to have to move three and a half million cubic yards of soil more than we originally planned. So that is, is what we call in the industry a very large change order due to uh, site conditions. That's our water system. We also run a sewer system in San Francisco. Even though our city is only seven miles by seven miles, we have over 1,000 miles of sewer pipe under, uh, zigzagging underneath the streets of San Francisco. We have primary treatment plants. We have Oceanside, which is our secondary or, or our smaller treatment plant uh, on the west side of town. We have our uh, North Point uh, treatment plant, which is a wet weather treatment plant. So in the wintertime when it's raining, that goes into operation. And then our mother load is our southeast plant which is down in the Bayview neighborhood, which handles 80% of all of the, uh, of the collection that we do in the city. It's then treated and discharged. Uh, to give you a sense of, of the age that we're dealing with, the infrastructure, Southeast was commissioned in 1952. This plant has been running 24-7 since 1952. So imagine trying to drive a car that was built in 72 and 52 and you'll get a sense of how urgent it is that we rebuild this thing. Our system, as I said, is very old. 33% of the 1,000 mile of sewers that we have on the street are over 100 years old. Old brick sewers. And this is what happens when a late 1800 brick sewer decides it's had enough and caves in. And this is a, an example of a sinkhole at 2nd and Lake Street. So we are very much running a race against time to rebuild our aging sewer system and to deal with climate change. You know, in San Francisco, we have what's called a combined sewer system. So we collect not only that which comes out of the toilets of all the buildings, but all of the rainwater that hits the streets and goes into the catch basins that are at the corners. We collect all of that. 
we have seen so many more guys. It's, it's funny to talk drought right now because we've been far from a drought. We have to plan our system to deal with all of the rainwater that hits San Francisco. And we work on what's called a design storm. And a five-year design storm is basically the largest storm you would anticipate coming over a five-year period. Well, in the last five years in San Francisco, we've had two five-year storms, one 10-year storm, and one 25-year storm. So we have been inundated with storms all up until this year. We're now to turn the opposite, and now we're in drought. So, so Mother Nature is seriously turning, uh, throwing some curveballs at us, where we're going from conditions where the bay is literally coming up onto the Embarcadero to drought conditions. Extremes are not our friend. And that's what we need to design to. And the challenge of the design is to design not only something that works, but something that's affordable. So what we're looking at, and we're calling our, 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 our plan gray, green, clean. So the gray infrastructure, concrete. Yes, we're going to build new treatment plants. We're going to build new tunnels. We're going to build new transport systems. But what else can we do that's green? So this is an example of a stormwater management solution, which is a swale down by our uh, pump station on the, west, on the east side of town. And so rain coming off the street instead of going into the catch basin and ending up at our treatment plants actually runs through this vegetation. And as it's kind of sifting through the vegetation, the roots of the plant system act to filter out all of the bad ingredients that the water picked up off of the streets. And then as it goes through, it basically act, acts like a filter. So by the time it gets to the end, it gets discharged into the bay. It's been filtered and cleaned to the levels to meet uh, uh, environmental protection requirements. So we're looking at more projects like this to say, look, let's not just build a lot of concrete. Let's not increase our, our demand. Let's figure out what we can do using nature to deal with the storms that we get. This is our overall program. Like I said, we need to not only uh, build something that works, but something that's affordable. Our program right now, phase one, $2.7 billion. Phase two, $3.2 billion. Our overall sewer system improvement program is $6.9 billion. So when you look just at the PUC, finishing our water program, tackling our sewer program, we're gonna do an additional billion dollars in hydroelectric upgrades up in Moccasin, and then we're also going to do improvements to our auxiliary water supply system for fire protection. Our capital improvement program is $9.8 billion over the next 10 years. So if you're asking whether or not there are opportunities in your immediate horizon, I can tell you our agency alone is going to be putting out $9.8 billion worth of construction in the next 10 years. And that's not taking into account the things that Muni is doing, the Trans Bay Terminal Project, Caltrans work, East Bay Mud work. So there is a vast opportunity within our industry. Our biosolids, I'll run through these quickly. Our biosolids, which is part of our southwest plant, this piece alone is $1.2 billion worth of work. The green infrastructure, like I said, trying to find ways to use Mother Nature, trying to do permeable pavement, trying to do uh, surface uh, uh, wetlands areas. Uh, these are all projects that would be able to be about $500 million worth of work in order to build areas that can capture water and use the earth to uh, penetrate through. The other thing we're doing is new innovative things. We're working with NOAA, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Association, to try to better detect rain. Not only when it's going to hit, but specifically where it's going to hit. So we're working with NOAA on two pilot projects. One is to put a new radar uh, uh, northwest of San Francisco, because we have a blind spot there as far as when storms are coming in off the ocean. Uh, that's a pretty straightforward project, but we're also working with them on uh, X-band radar, which would actually break the, the city up into multiple grids and be able to see where exactly in the city the rain is going to fall. So imagine if you live in Noe Valley, you would actually be able to pull out your iPhone, hit an app, and find out if it's going to rain in your neighborhood and at what time it's going to rain. So if you're simply going to the local market, that'll help you out. What it does for us is it helps us map out where that water is going to hit, which of our transport systems are going to be most impacted by that, and how much flow we're going to be getting hour by hour over the course of the storm. Overall, San Francisco has the capacity to 
Treat and store 775 million gallons of storm water and sewer on a daily basis. And you know, I, it's, I, I deal with large numbers. I deal with millions of gallons and billions of dollars. And, and, and I like to just kind of bring it down and say, you know, in the morning, for those of you who are cereal eaters, you wake up and you pull out a fresh gallon of milk out of the fridge. Imagine 575 million of those gallons of milk. That's how much we can treat in a day as part of the overall sewer system. Now as far as the PUC, uh, I was having a really good career in the private sector. Uh, I had done a, uh, almost 12 years in the, for the city and county before, um, and this opportunity came up uh, because a, a gentleman who was in my seat, and who's somebody I worked with and had known for over 20 years, uh, was promoted to the general manager. And so he asked me, you know, why don't you look into this opportunity that's coming up? And the one thing, aside from the opportunity to run a $10 billion program, which, which kind of comes once in a lifetime, that interested me was the PUC is also an extremely progressive organization. It really knows about the big picture and about policy and how policy changes people, not just from a technical perspective. And so the things that are really of interest to me is that when we're going on building a project, we don't just get the engineers in a room and figure out what is the best technical solution. We go out to the neighborhoods. We do presentation in the neighborhoods. We do online surveys. We ask what are the things that motivate people, what are the quality of life issues, so that when we're designing something, it's not only going to work technically, but it's going to make the people who live in the neighborhood where we're doing construction feel better about their own neighborhood. We believe in education. Uh, we spend $2 million a year working with San Francisco Unified School District and other agencies just to create awareness about the important issues surrounding water use, wastewater treatment, and power in the state of California. Uh, we believe in reaching out into communities. Um, we've done uh, youth and adult training opportunities. Summer employment. This summer, we hired over 670 people between the ages of 14 and 21 because we wanted to create opportunities for people who have interest in the technical world. So we have something called Project Pool where we reach into high schools in the most disadvantaged neighborhoods in San Francisco and offer them summer employment and put them in engineering offices, construction offices, accounting offices, administration offices so they have an exposure to the professional world at a high school age so they can get a sense of what it is going to take and start to think about the decisions they're making in high school because that ultimately is what, what translates into the, uh, college and translates into employment. We do summer uh, college internship programs. We do summer, uh, we do full year part-time employment with college students and we focus on the neighborhoods that have the most disadvantaged. Like I said, growing up, if there was anything like this, my road would have been a lot easier. I'm lucky, as I said, because I had my parents. My road was difficult, but it was well worth it. Nowadays, students have access to so many more programs, so many more opportunities, and there is so much more diversity in management these days than when I was your age, so that there is a far better understanding. Um, Harlan Kelly, who's the general manager and my boss, grew up in Fresno and went to City College in Fresno before he transferred over to uh, uh, University of uh, Berkeley. I had trouble saying Berkeley, that's my arch rival having gone to Stanford. Uh, but he transferred over to Berkeley and uh, got his engineering degree there. And has, he went into the public sector and did his whole career. So he's been with the city for 28 years, I think and is now the general manager of one of the largest utility agencies in the entire country. So we really believe in reaching back. Another, actually one more thing I'll say about community benefits. We know that, that we are helping the neighborhoods and the things that we build. But we also are asking ancillarily, what else can we do? We know that we're helping business in all the contracts that we give. So one of the things we've done is we've gone to our engineering consultants and said, look, we give you multi-million dollar contracts to do work here. You make good money in it, that's fine. But now we're asking, what are you gonna do with your profits that are gonna help the communities that we impact when we go into construction, when we have a sewer treatment plant right across the street from a, from a neighborhood? 
And, and we made it so now 5% of the selection process when we're hiring a consultant is based on what we ask them to do with their profits, giving back to the community. And as a result of making that a voluntary process, um, we now have $4 million worth of private sector money committed to doing things like scholarships in the Bayview, summer internship programs. One of our engineering firms that we have under contract hired 32 kids this summer uh, in order to give them exposure to the technical world. Um, doing uh, mentoring, doing training. $4 million worth of benefit to communities that are, that are disadvantaged simply because we created a policy that nobody else had thought of before. Finally, training and, and internship programs. I think I've talked a lot about that. Uh, contracting opportunities. Uh, don't think I've got too many contractors in the room. But we also reach out and try to create opportunities for them. We just opened our contractor assistance center uh, in the Bayview, where we have a, a seven day, a five days a week, full time, doors open. We're going to start programming it, bringing small contractors in so that they can learn how to estimate jobs better, how they can learn to bid jobs better, how they can learn to work with prime contractors better. Again, simply creating opportunity. Employment, we have 2,400 positions at the PUC. Uh, within infrastructure, I have 375 engineers, construction managers, environmental specialists, scientists, and uh, financial people. Uh, but there are also a plethora of opportunities in operations side, and one of the things that I've noticed definitely is for those who are working in the operations side, it, it used to be if you were a good mechanic, you could get a job no matter what. Nowadays, you've got to be just as good on the iPad as you are with the wrench, because so much of what we are building has a technical component to it. So much of it has a computer link to it that you've got to be able to do computer diagnostics just to be able to be a mechanic. And so that's another arena where the technical field is creating opportunities. The last thing, a little more humorous, we, everybody understands water. You get thirsty, you drink water, you appreciate water. Nobody really appreciates what happens after you flush the toilet. That's our problem. So part of our issue is how do we get people to pay more attention to that whole system that happens underground after you flush? because we're gonna be coming to San Francisco and asking for a rate increase to pay for that $6.9 billion program. So we are just started our awareness program. We have these on the side of Muni buses. Um, my favorite is uh, your number two is my number one. <laughs> but basically trying to make people aware, and this is another area where the PUC is being more progressive. You know, let's not hide what we do. Let's come out and tell people and let's make them aware because they need to know that when they flush, something happens and somebody takes care of it for them. And it needs to be paid for. So that's the PUC in a nutshell. Um, as I said, it's a great organization. Um, if you have uh, any interest, definitely uh, keep us in mind. Look on our website, look for our summer internship opportunities, look for our full-time uh, full and part-time opportunities uh, because we would love to have you. And with that, I'll open up the questions. So, so Clean Power SF is, is on the electric side, and it's uh, um, solar power, uh, and it's kind of divested outside of the organization, and the organization has historically been funding the uh, startup phase of clean power. We have a particular challenge now on the power side, uh, in part because, as I said before, we sell electricity to all the city agencies, and we actually have been selling it at below market rate uh, because we are an agency of the city and county of San Francisco, and so we've been helping our sister agencies by giving them electricity at a family rate, let's say. Um, we are now at a point where we don't, can't do that anymore. The cost of, of production of hydroelectric power, and especially given the drought, the reduction of hydroelectric power is going to create a challenge. So solar, Go Solar is one of the projects that there's a lot of public interest behind. I don't know at the end of the day what the financial capacity is going to be for the organization to stay behind. 
because as I said earlier, we create all this hydroelectric, I mean all this hydroelectric power by the water that we bring from Hetch Hetchy down. Now that we're in a drought, now that we're asking our customers to do a 10% reduction in water use, that's 10% less water we're running through our hydroelectric system, that's 10% less power, and 10% less power revenues that we're getting as an agency. So the WISIP program was primarily focused around resiliency and redundancy for seismic activity. So we have, as I said, a gravity flow system. The pipes, I forget the exact numbers, I think are in the neighborhood of 72 inch uh, high pressure. Uh, these pipes run at an extremely high pressure. Uh, to give you a sense, we had uh, one, uh, these pipes are in areas, that, in the shallow areas, they're about 15, 20 feet deep. We had one pipe get a, a hole in it uh, about the size of a quarter. The pressure coming out of that water caused, I mean, out of, out of that pipe caused that water to shoot through that hole, kind of like a blowhole on a whale, with enough pressure to actually move the entire 20 feet of dirt that was above it and shoot a geyser about 20 feet into the air. So that's the kind of pressure that we, we're dealing with with our transmission system. So what we've done is, in most cases, built parallel new tunnels next to the old ones that will ultimately trans uh, transfer the main use into the new tunnels, keeping some of the old tunnels that are still in good condition as backups. But where we have our biggest challenge is actually on the East Bay, because we anticipate that the largest earthquake in the Bay Area that we're gonna be getting is gonna come from the Hayward Fault. And so we cross the Hayward Fault as we're bringing those down. And, and we, we are in the early phases of construction of a seismic joint that has been designed uh, by one of the companies that's under a contract with us. First of the world, this seismic joint is actually designed to take the 72 inch high pressure water pipe and in the event of a major earthquake on the fault, the pipe will, the, the joint will be able to move four and a half feet in each direction and not interrupt the water flow to the city. So, so picture four and a half feet of movement on a 72 inch high pressure pipe. Ultimately, obviously, right after the earthquake, we're gonna to need to rebuild the joint, but it will, as designed, not interrupt our water flow supply. So that's the kind of work we've been doing on redundancy and resiliency to get water from Hetchy to the Bay Area and into our local reservoirs and into the tap. Yes. Uh. Uh, so two questions about the hedge cheese. So I think you, I think you partially addressed it with the high, the high pressure, and, it, and it, I gather you build up the high pressure from the gravity difference from hedge hedge down here. Is that what maintains to be able to flow up the peninsula? And then uh, a question in the system: What makes the hydroelectric you do green hydroelectric? So um, the second is is yes, we take full advantage of the of the uh, uh, elevation difference in order to do a full gravity system all the way down into the peninsula where it, it, will, it does continue up into the city, but we do divert a certain amount of water to fill the local reservoirs. And in particular, in the event that there's a problem with transmission, we have local supplies for, for emergencies. Uh, green is interesting because there's, there's all kinds of definitions of green. <coughs> So, so hydroelectric power is green because it, it does not use any fossil fuels for its generation. So our water up in Hetch Hetchy primarily comes from the snowpack in the, in, the, in the mountains. In the spring, the snow melts, it melts, it runs through the mountains, falls into our reservoir, and then from the reservoir through our hydroelectric plants, generating electricity without the use of any fossil fuels. Um, on the issue of, uh, of go solar, you know, the state is now promoting um, green fuel. And so they're creating the opportunity for agencies like the public, like uh, us, who have never sold electricity to private residences. We only sell to commercial residents and to municipal loads. Actually, we only sold, sell to municipal loads. Um, it created the opportunity for us to sell to residences if it's green. So we can't take uh, fossil fuel and, and create energy and sell it. 
But the interesting politics behind it was it had to be new green. So all of the electricity we generate at Hetch Hetchy is green, but under the law, it's not doesn't count, and we can't use it because it's not new green. So we would have to build a new hydroelectric plant to use that, or we would need to go into the commercial market of green energy and use Rex, which is a completely convoluted system that I haven't even learned uh, in its totality yet. Yes. Hi. Um, are the senior employees of the PUC appointed by council members or the voting public or the mayor or the state? The general manager, which is the top position within the PUC, is appointed by the commission. The San Francisco Public Utilities Commission manages the agency and appoints the general manager. The commission themselves are appointed by, there are five commissions, they are appointed both by the mayor and the San Francisco Board of Supervisors. The general manager then is the appointing officer for the other 2,400 staff members at the PUC. So the GM is, is appointed by commission, and then the GM is responsible as the appointing officer for the rest of the department. Yes. Um, are PUC employees under the union contract? Most of our employees are unionized. In fact, all of our employees are unionized. Um, we have about 14 different unions within the PUC, plumbers, carpenters, electricians, uh, service employees and management actually even has a union because I forget now around 1990 um, the city of San Francisco went to something that's referred to as collective bargaining for all of its employees and under that charter change it said that any unrepresented employees would be simply their sellers would simply be set by the mayor and so management decided that they were going to create their own union so that they could be represented rather than having their, their salary dictated. So we have what's called the MEA, uh, Management Employee Association. So I would say out of the, I don't even know how many employees there are in the city, probably 27,000 employees, I would say 99% of them are represented by a union. Yes. My last question, um, what is your present position preparing you for in the future? It's a good question. Um, I actually have done all of my career has been focused on capital programs primarily in the transportation arena and so I was uh, the program manager for the reconstruction of the Embarcadero uh, in San Francisco looking around the room I, I can pretty much guess that none of you can remember what the Embarcadero used to look like uh, but it was uh, the remnants of the brake bulk shipping industry uh, back when the Port of San Francisco was a vibrant port. And what was left was uh, old railroad tracks, uh, ballast, which is the rock in between the railroad tracks, the wooden ties, and asphalt. And it was a generally unattractive place. Um, when I started with the city, I was willing to take on a lot of new risks and a lot more responsibility than my junior civil engineer title and salary uh, warranted. Uh, but I was interested in learning. And um, because of that, I wound up being asked in 1989 when the Loma Prieta earthquake hit to be one of a five-member task team move into the Marina District and manage the reconstruction effort within the Marina District because that was the part of the city that had been most hit. Then that experience parlayed me into an opportunity to work on this particular project where I ultimately became the program manager. Um, my willingness to take risks and kind of push my envelope, coupled with the city's willingness to take risks on, on younger people, at least at that time and with the people I worked for, actually had me at the age of 27 running a $500 million program uh, for the city and county of San Francisco. So I did that. Um, got interested in the port because it was along the port and I became the director of operations for the port. Um, did the Muni thing, and so everything was transportation uh, uh, related. Um, and even when I went into the private sector, because of my background in transportation, most of the projects that I ran in the private sector, I was the original program manager on the $1.5 billion 
uh, Central Subway project and the uh, program manager for the $4.2 billion Transway Terminal project. All transportation. So when this opportunity came up, I said earlier I was interested in A, because of its size, B, because of the progressive policies of the PUC, but then C, the other thing I thought is I'm not too old to learn. And all of my career has been in transportation, let me move into the water wastewater industry and learn. So my goal is to spend about six years in the agency, learn everything I can about water wastewater, coupled with my background already in capital delivery, and then at that point, probably move back into the private sector and make myself double uh, valuable by having both the transportation and water wastewater background. <coughs> Seems like your agency deals more with like uh, civil engineering work. Are there roles in your agency for like chemical? Yes, definitely. Um, the the you know it's funny when when you talk about the wastewater industry, the sewer side. You know, people don't have a really grandiose vision of what a sewer worker does. It is an extremely complicated and scientific process, and we have labs and we have scientists. Uh, dealing with all the chemicals associated with treating uh, the wastewater side. And so yes, we have, uh, we don't have chemical engineers on the capital delivery side, but we definitely have scientists and, and, and people dealing on the, with the chemical side of the world on the operation side. And, and these guys really are committed to their job. You know, you could, um, you could put enough chemicals, it's not hard to put enough chemicals into the system to clean it. But the more chemicals you put in, at the end of the day, everything we treat, we discharge either into the bay or into the ocean. So it goes back into nature. So the more chemicals you use, the more potential impact it has on the discharge. And, and as long as we're under the EPA guidelines, we're fine. Our guys aren't happy just being under the guidelines. They are literally monitoring what the plant is doing on an hourly basis and adjusting the chemical content so that we're just above meeting what we need to clean it, but well below the environmental impact. Um, and so, so, so again, it's, it, it, you know, people kind of picture more of the guy down in the sewer, cleaning the sewer, yes, we've got those, but there are a whole lot of interesting technical components in the plant itself, in the lab, um, that deal with, with the daily impacts of, of what we do on the uh, environment. Can you tell us what you would look for or what advice you give for students Yes. Um, the first thing would be energy uh, and commitment. You know, I don't expect interns to come in and um, know what they need to do. I want them to come in with a hunger, an appetite to learn, and an energy that will help lift the morale of the whole organization. I can tell you that having gone through college, and, and this may be pessimistic, but basically there's one thing I learned in college. <laughs> one thing. I learned how to learn. So that every new job I've taken, I've learned that job on the job. And yes, you know, when I first started out as an engineer, knowing the calculus, knowing the physics, knowing all that helped. But what I really learned was how to walk into a brand new environment and learn what I needed to know to be successful in that environment. So that's what I'm looking for, somebody who's willing to and, and expresses that interest in coming in and learning everything they can from the experience. Uh, both because it benefits you, but because it benefits our organization too. You know, There are engineers working for the city who have been there 32 years. You know, and you, you know, I'm sure they're really good engineers, but it's kind of hard to work in the same place for 32 years and not get a little bit of ho hum. <laughs> so when people like you come into the agency and start asking questions and start showing energy and start showing vitality, it helps the whole organization. So, uh, so basically, really, what I look for is be articulate, be respectful, and be energetic. And those are the three things I look for in interest. Can you talk at all about the, the goal to be zero emission by 2030? Zero emission in what? The zero emission city. 
in the PUC's uh, 2011? Yeah. Um, I mean, it may be too early to. The, the, we have a department called the Department of Environment, and they're the ones who are going to be taking the lead on that. Uh, certainly, we do everything we can to reduce our carbon footprint. Um, if you're ever in San Francisco, pop into our headquarters. Uh, we finished construction a year ago and moved in. Uh, it is a LEED Platinum building and arguably the most energy efficient building in the entire country. Uh, aside from the obvious things of solar power and wind turbine power, uh, low flow toilets, uh, all of the things that are typical, we actually have a living machine in the building. So we have a, water, a wastewater treatment plant in our building so that when we flush, we flush into our own living machine. Our living machine handles our own waste, uh, recycles the water, and then reuses non-potable water for our uh, non-potable uses. Uh, so, so definitely we have a commitment to zero emission. Um, getting off the grid is one of the goals for the biosolids treatment plant. Uh, as, as we move into new technologies, these new technologies tend to use a lot more energy. So recapture is one of the things we're looking for. So we are going to definitely look at um, our biosolids doing uh, uh, possibly biomethane reuse, but certainly biogas reuse. Um, we are looking also at, uh, actually it's interesting, we, we started um, you know, finding challenges that create opportunities. We run a, a biological treatment process. Basically, we grow bacteria, and we send the, send the effluent into these pots full of bacteria, and the bacteria eat all of the organics, which is the food you ate and digested and sent our way. Um, and so we need to continue to grow bacteria. That is our main source. When restaurants throw grease down the toilet, that grease gets into our system, and it kills the bacteria, which is really bad for us. So we, we went out and decided we were gonna actually voluntarily go to restaurants and pick up their grease just to prevent them from putting it in the toilet to take away the negative impact that we have on our system. We started a grease pickup program. Uh, it's actually called our fall program, Fats, Oils, and Greases. And we bring that grease, um, which is basically coming from the fryers at McDonald's and the like, and we actually, built a filter system within the, uh, uh, our treatment plant. We now take that grease, run it through our filter system, turn it into uh, uh, energy, and actually went onto the market and started selling this energy. So what started out as, look, let's just get the grease to keep it out of our, our system. We're now generating about, I forget the exact number, but I think it's $400,000 a year on energy we sell based on the oil we pull out of grease fryers. Um, the other piece is, uh, and this is to me the most interesting, but the greases that come out of the actual traps, the real dirty grease, the brown grease we call it, we also collect that for free. We take that over to our uh, Oceanside plant, we treat that, run through four, four processes of treatment, and at the end of the day get a clean, waterproof grease that we turn around and sell I know you're never going to guess who our biggest buyer of that is. It's actually overseas to makeup companies who use it to make lip balm. <laughs> <laughs> so we are totally committed to reuse, recycle. Um, but, you know, we are literally taking every component of our system and saying, what can we do to improve it? All the transmission is, well, almost all the transmission is owned by pg &E. And so we have a tolling agreement with pg &E where when we generate electricity, we uh, uh, transmit that electricity through pg &E's lines. And we have a, a T&D agreement with them, transmission and distribution. And we simply, uh, it's kind of like a bank account. So we keep track of how much electricity we put in and how much we take out. And at the end of the day, if there's energy left, we can turn around and sell it to PG&E, who can then turn around and sell it to you. But we have to sell it to PG&E at a really low rate based on our tolling agreement. So 
It, 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 we do pay for it, uh, but at the end of the day, it's cheaper than us building our own transmission system. Right? So it's, it, picture a highway, and you build two buildings near the highway. It's going to be a lot cheaper for you to just pay the toll to get on the highway than build your own road from one building to the next. Yes? Uh, for interns, you said um, bring like energy, but for like the application process, like, I don't know. How would you add energy to the application? <laughs> 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 that's why I want to like, I understand like, you're asking to like, get interviews, like you can show your energy, but like, as application wise, like, so what would you, what do you guys look for? On the paper application, basically just, you know, the, uh, the what your interest is and, and what you've done to advance that interest. So if your interest is civil engineering, what coursework have you taken to move you towards that civil engineering goal? You know, if you tell me you want to be a chemical engineer and then I see your resume is a bunch of psychology classes, I'm going to question your you know, commitment to that. Um, so basically on the, on the paper, I will tell you this, that I am not uh, at all a fan. The paper process needs to be there because there are just so many applications that come in. But I am not a fan of the paper application, you know, because I, you don't know somebody who you meet them. And I will tell you throughout my career, um, as I said, I've had some really opportunities at a young age, um, but I've also had a lot of doors closed at a young age because I filled out the paper application and they told me, oh no, you're not qualified based on you're too young, you don't have enough experience. Um, so to me, uh, it's all about the face-to-face. -face. And, and that not only goes through the interview process, but that's the work environment, that's how you manage. Um, you know, I'm. I'm old school, I actually don't like email, you know, because I have found people are just excessively using email as an excuse to not meet with someone face to face. You know, and I tell my staff, you know, did you do this? And they said, yeah, I sent them an email. I said, no, you didn't do it then. Sending an email is often passive aggressive. I sent the email, so I'm done, so now it's their fault. Well, did they read the email? I don't know. All right. So I really believe that the core of good management is a face-to-face -face experience. And sure, email is good for quick things. Text messaging is good for quick things. But at the end of the day, you need to be able to sit down, look at someone face-to-face, -face, talk to them in order for you guys to know you're on the same page.